the Tuesday, May 4th, 2021 special meeting of the Market City Commission is now called to order at 5.15 p.m. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. City Clerk, could you please conduct a roll call? Thank you, Mayor. Commissioner Bonsall? Here. Commissioner Davis? Present. Commissioner Hanley? Here. Commissioner Mayor? Here. Commissioner Stonehouse? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hill? Here. And Mayor Smith? Here. We are all present. Commissioners, we have an agenda. We have a motion on this agenda. Commissioner Davis? I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Okay, do we have a second? Commissioner Mayor? I'll second that motion. All in favor, please say yes. 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 All opposed, please say no. Motion passes 7-0. I have no announcements. Brings us to public comment. Comments may not exceed three minutes per person. Please state your name and physical address when making public comments. Do we have any comment this evening? Uh, we do have uh, one mysterious person in the Zoom waiting room. It just says iPhone. So if you give me a second, I'll let them in. And sure. You we can, can see. see if they'd like to make a comment. This takes a minute to get set up here. It's connecting to audio. Looks like maybe we're connected. We have one individual in the waiting room on Zoom who are wondering if that person would like to make a public comment. It says iPhone. Oh, it's still connecting. You can see the little dots kind of dancing. Going once. All right, well, we do have a second public comment session at the end of the meeting. So at this point, it does not look like that person is connecting to the audio. Um, if you're having any issues, feel free to send a message in chat and we can probably work that out. And that is it for comment. No one, no one else for public comment. Okay, public comment is now closed for this section. On to consent. Do we have a motion on the consent agenda, commissioners? Commissioner Hanley. I motion that we approve the minutes of the May 1st agenda or the consent agenda. And we have a second, Commissioner Bonsall? I'll second that motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Yes, yes. All opposed, please say no. Motion passes 7-0. Moving on to new business, city manager search. So we conducted interviews this past Saturday, May 1st, all day. We had six fantastic candidates for our city manager selection. And at this point in time, we're going to have um, probably some discussion, um, and I'll ask for a motion maybe for discussion in a minute, but I just wanted to kind of frame this to say, I had asked the commission to come prepared to name their top two candidates based on those interviews, based on the um, application materials, education experience, the needs of our city, and um, from that discussion and where we name our top two candidates, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can um, figure out next steps but given my takeaway from Saturday, we've got so many great people that we interviewed. And I know other commissioners are probably feeling that same way, that a second round of interviews may be necessary. Um, so I just wanna put that out there as something to probably discuss as we move forward. So do we have a motion to suspend the rules for some discussion on this item, Commissioner Mayor? Uh, Madam Mayor, I motion to uh, suspend the rules. And do we have a second on that, Commissioner Hanley? I second that motion. All in favor, please say yes. 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 All opposed, please say no. Motion to suspend the rules passes 7-0. So at this point in time, um, kind of like I do when we go through commissioner comments, I'll go through um, the commission. Everyone name your top two candidates. At this point, I think just state the names and we'll come back for some more discussion once we kind of have all those names down on paper. And we will start things off with Commissioner Stonehouse and then roll over to the other side of the table here. Go ahead, Commissioner Stonehouse. Your Honor, I would submit my two names will be Gary Simpson and Richard Downey. Okay, just making sure I'm writing these down. Commissioner Bonsall. 
Uh, my two names would be uh, Karen Kovacs and John Kramer. Commissioner Davis. I'm going to only submit one name, and that is John Kramer. Okay. Mr. Hanley. My two names are Karen Kovacs and John Kramer. Mayor Pro Tem Hill. It was a very difficult choice. <laughs> um, my two names are Kovacs and um, um, Stoltman. Commissioner Mayor. I had a very, very hard time on the second one, but I'm going to uh, say that my two names are Richard Downey and the second is Sean Hobbins. And my two names are John Kramer and Karen Kovacs. So, Kind of absorbing here for a minute where we're at with kind of the most common ones but that doesn't necessarily mean that that is the next step in this process either um, by a quick glance i have four commissioners who listed john kramer and four commissioners who listed karen kovacs as one of their top two and I don't see anyone else coming close with a four. Does that sound accurate to other commissioners? And city clerk is giving me a head nod. Um, I'm not sure if we need a lot of discussion right now or if we think that um, it's where we'd want to maybe do a second round interview with our top folks. Uh, I welcome the commission's comments. Go ahead, Commissioner Stonehouse. Your Honor, I suggest we do another vote. Sure. Since we have clarified positions and people might be willing to look at the other candidate closer. Absolutely. And um, I think that makes sense, especially um, for, you know, someone like myself who had a really close third. Um, I know other people may be in that similar situation. So we'll go ahead and start things off with you again, Commissioner Stonehouse, on the second round. You want two, Your Honor? Or one name? What do we think, Commissioners? Two or one? I think two. Two. I'd be more comfortable with two. Okay, go ahead. Two. Well, then, Your Honor, I would make it more complicated by saying uh, one for Kovac and one for Kramer. I don't know that that's more complicated, mm -hmm. but I appreciate it, Commissioner Stonehouse. Um, Commissioner Bonzel? Uh, same for me. Uh, Karen Kovacs, number one, and uh, John Kramer, number two. Commissioner Davis? I'll stick with my one for John Kramer. Thank you. Mr. Hanley, I will keep mine the same with Karen as my number one and John as my number two. Just catching up here. Thank you. Commissioner or Mayor for Time Hill. Um, Kovacs and Kramer. Commissioner Mayor. Uh, Kovacs, Kramer. And I will stick with Kramer, Kovacs. Okay. It looks to me like we may need a second round interview with these two individuals. It seems like a natural progression at this point. I think it's evident by the number of, um, you know, first round of our, kind of our first round draft, there were some extra names in there because some folks did a fantastic job, but we were able, thank you, Commissioner Stonehouse, for the great idea to kind of narrow the field a little. Um, and it seems like I think we could be in agreement on a second round interview. Now talking with our consultant, Frank Welsh, earlier today about how difficult that was, this was likely going to be, he made a suggestion that I really appreciated and I think we might want to consider, which would be to do a second round interview with the commission via Zoom and have the department heads watch and um, have them funnel their feedback to me as the mayor afterwards which I could assimilate and send to the commission via email, which would be foyable for the public, but it, I would blind carbon copy. So we're not having a conversation, but then at least you could get the boiled down notes of what the department has thought about the second round interview. 
So something I've been thinking about. Um, Commissioner Bonsall, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, my immediate question, uh, I, first of all, I agree that a second, excuse me, a second interview makes sense. Um, my question would be, how are we going to formulate the questions for the, the second round interview? Would we rely on our consultant again? Um, and would we be the ones asking the questions? Or I mean, so I think that's, that's uh, what do the logistics look like? Sure, and I know um, talking with at least Mayor Pro Tem Hill, she had a suggestion for one question that I think would be um, important. And I think if you don't mind, I'll try to paraphrase. It was something along the lines of how do you resolve, oh, maybe I shouldn't say it. No, well, I, yeah. Because uh, we, maybe we want to keep those questions a secret until the interview happens. It just <laughs> occurred to me. Well, no, I'd rather, I'm fine with people being prepared, actually. Okay, um, go ahead. I don't, these aren't, these aren't, um, I, uh, I did want to say, yeah, I think we had an incredibly strong foundation to help understand um, these folks. And again, really, t really tough choice. Um, and I, um, but I had questions about, um, we talked a lot about teamwork, which is a really important quality, but I'm also interested in hearing, I mean, conflict is inevitable, and how one would work through the conflicts that would inevitably arise um, as a question, questions, um, both within, with internally and externally, I think are important co concepts to understand. Um, and I feel like I had another one um, that came to me but that, that's top of mind. I think I'm wondering, I know Frank, I know you're at Frank Walsh, our consultant, to help us with this hiring process. I know he's on the call, and I'm wondering if maybe he can um, pop up on Zoom. I know that may take some finagling here by our city clerk um, for a recommendation on the, how the questions would be formatted, formed, and I know we would also have an opportunity to review those ahead of time and maybe make any suggested changes. Commissioner Stonehouse? Your Honor, I was only going to suggest that maybe the best way to do this would be since we have a virtual tie, we have seven commissioners, we each have one vote. And we don't go into a second round of, of interviews. We don't continue to drag this. We make a decision. I'm not comfortable doing that. And we can do that by simply having each commissioner with one vote of the two candidates. I, I understand. It's something worth considering, but I feel close enough on these two that I would also not feel very comfortable with, with well, making a vote. We have at this to make point. the decision, and that's what we do. That's what we're paid to do. Yep, but I think it's okay if that decision takes a little bit longer. Other commissioners? Commissioner Bonswell? Yeah, I would say I definitely understand Commissioner Stonehouse's desire uh, to finalize this decision, but um, I, although personally I would feel comfortable giving one vote i mean i definitely understand why I mean, the candidates were incredibly close i mean it's really splitting hairs at a certain point and i think that a second round interview would be helpful uh it seems like to many of us and i mean i could change my mind as well so i i personally favor the uh second round of interviews rather than an immediate vote although i understand why commissioner stonehouse wants to do that. I do too. And I know there's an urgency with Mike Angeli leaving, but I would say at this point with an external candidate, it could be difficult to get them here in time to sit with Mike anyway. Um, so I would rather not rush that decision if we don't need to. Um, hi, Frank. Thank you for joining us and for popping up when we need you here. And um, I'm sure you're following along. One of the questions was for a second round, how would we come up with those questions? What would be your suggestion? Um, well, I would um, draft a list for you, uh, similar to what happened uh, uh, last week, and get those to you and uh, make sure they align with where you'd like to go. I take suggestions directly from the elected uh, officials as well, and I'll come up with a list of whatever date you choose for these, uh, for these Zoom second round interviews. I'll have them to you uh, 48 hours in advance so you can look them over and let me know if there's any changes. Okay. And then with it potentially being a Zoom interview, I think Commissioner Bonzel, you had a good point too of who asks the questions and we can probably figure out that logistic, but it may be, um, it may make more sense to have one individual such as myself or another person ask all of the questions for, for the Zoom issue. Um, Commissioner Hanley. Um, the one thing I would ask is during these interviews where, well, we got a lot of information presented to us, some, there were some things that I would personally have liked to have asked of each of the candidates or a, asking for certain things to be exaggerated. I can do this. No. <laughs> I would like to have known a little more information. Is it possible that at the end we each get to ask one question 
of the candidates that are being Zoom interviewed so that if we have something that came up or something that we have a question about or something that we would like to know a little more about, we could personally ask a question of each candidate? Potentially, um, in the HR field, you try to ask all the candidates the same exact question. So it would probably have to, in my mind, and maybe I'm wrong here, someone can step in and say we don't have to do that, but you'd want to give them a fair chance to, to be able to answer similar questions. So you might want to find a question that you'd want to ask of both of them. But, but we could potentially work that in, right, Frank? That's something we could. Correct, right, yeah. I think uh, I'm trying, if I was understanding the point of uh, Commissioner Hanley correctly, um, if, if, if something comes up, like if you ask a question and it leads to something about a green tree, and you're more interested in, and you have a follow up on that. And I guess this gets to maybe to Commissioner Davis's uh, point on Saturday. I'd, I'd rather add some dialogue. If you want to follow up with them and ask them, if they bring something up that um, draws your interest, you can always follow up with a question. Tell me more about that green tree. I'm interested in how that works. Um, you certainly are able to do that because that keeps the original questions consistent, but you can follow up if need be. I hope that addresses your question. Mm -hmm. No, that's perfect. Thank you. Did I see Commissioner Mayor's hand? Sorry, I thought I saw that at one point. So. Okay, Commissioner Stonehouse? I was only going to comment, Your Honor. I, I really thought the way we did it last time was quite appropriate where the dialogue is with individual commissioners because they are working for us as a commission. They are not working for the mayor. And while I understand that the HR side of it would like to have absolute consistency, I understand, too, that we live in a living, breathing world with real people. And I think that needs to be a significant portion of any interview that we do. So I would suggest we follow on with something very similar to what we did previously with the expectation that if a question draws an answer from a commissioner or draws a comment or a question in his mind, he follows up with that. And at that point, remember, we only have two, mm -hmm. that we hold a dialogue, then we move on to the next person rather than have a, a, a master of ceremonies running the affair. Understood. I appreciate that. Commissioner Stonehouse. Commissioner Bonzo. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so I guess the other question would then be, when are we going to do this? We have a regular meeting next week, but do we feel that there's enough time there? I mean, we may have a, a full agenda. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I mean, don't know. That when we would we want to mm -hmm. schedule another, another meeting? I think that the scheduling may have to happen outside of this meeting, but my hope would that be that we can get it rolling sooner than later. If it's via Zoom, there may be some flexibility with us as commissioners to do it via Zoom as well. We'll have to talk about that and how that would go. Um, but yeah, I think we'll have to work on scheduling after the fact and see where we can fit these things in. It may not be on the same day for both candidates either. I mean, we'd have flexibility to do one and then do the other another day or, or together. We'll see. So I think, oh, go ahead, Commissioner Mayor. All right, I'm, I'm gonna say two different things that were brought up, but uh, the first one being whether or not we should do another meeting or the vote thing. Um, I, I see a lot of value in doing the second meeting. I, however, right now could cast a vote and not feel any sort of indecisiveness about it. And I just wanted to say that, but we kind of got, got going on the next topic. But next thing was if we do do the interview, I do like the concept of even if it wasn't the last question at the end, even just being able to follow up and ask them to like maybe give a little bit more specifics on the said question they're on, I think it would be helpful. I don't think any of us really were diverting from the questions too much the last time. And I'm sure we all had like things for each question that were like, oh, like really wish I could ask them to like kind of go in more detail with that. Yeah. Okay, good. Any other discussion? I will second, or sorry, I will say the fact that I also could vote today if we wanted to, and I would be very sure of my vote. But I understand the need. They are very close candidates, and I could see why we would want to possibly elaborate for other people on these. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Hanley. Um, thinking um, okay sounds like we've got a few folks who want potentially would be willing to take a vote today but I'm not hearing that as the majority so I mean I'm willing to entertain a motion to, to do that or to hold a second round but um, I think I can see the direction that this is going would be maybe be a second round but I could be wrong so I'm willing to entertain a motion Commissioner Bonzel 
Um, I mean, I, I think that even if there are just a couple of commissioners who still are very 50-50 on this, that I, I still would say that I think it makes sense to do another round of interviews. I mean, it, it does seem that actually a slim majority of the commissioners say they'd be comfortable um, voting now, but I don't necessarily think that's the right way to go about this. Um, this is a big decision, right? For like, I think we all expressed at some point, like the next five years, hopefully. So, <laughs> I've got our city manager flagging me down over here. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> We've cut your mic preemptively. Sorry, I didn't tell you about that. Use the mic. It's okay. We can wait. I just wanted to add, at a city manager's point of view, that if I was running for this position, I would hope that I would get seven votes. And I think that the more time you take and the better you, you move towards uh, a you know, majority of seven, um, seven votes, I would think that'd be the better route to take and, as opposed to a 4-3 or a 5-2 or something like that. Absolutely. So, thank you. Thank you for weighing in, Mike. We want to make sure that you know whoever we pick has a lot of confidence coming into this position. Okay, uh, do we have a motion? I mean, are we okay with discussion? Does anyone else have additional discussion on this? Do we have a motion um, for how to proceed? Commissioner well, Stonehouse? Well, a comment, Your Honor, before a motion. Uh, if we move to a second round, I would hope that we're able to focus that round on dialogue as opposed to just question. Sure. Because this is really our opportunity with only two candidates to hold discussion and to get a little better understanding of who they are and what they can do versus what we did for the initial rounds. So Frank, that would be a change, I think, in how you might be thinking of questioning uh, what, again, with the commissioner's ability to hold a conversation and to learn more about them than just what we would do with a second round. I'm thinking as we're talking, I, I would agree with that. And then that might be providing more opportunity for questions of the candidate in between to ask us some questions to start some of that dialogue. And maybe I'm a little off, but there's there's a different way to kind of structure it to get the cadence to go back and forth a little more. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Stonehouse. That's a great point. Motion on the process, Mayor Pro Tem Hill. One more piece of discussion. I mean, the other question that I had was whether we're at a position to start discussing the strategic plan issues that have been had that have been raised by the commission, and whether we wanted to bring that into the interview or not, uh, that's an open, that's a question um, because that is we've had the two strategic plan sessions to talk about what we want to do next, and maybe running that by the candidates would be another way to um, have a good dialogue. Good point, and I would encourage commissioners to send an email to Frank or call Frank with ideas for the questions or next round. Um, if, if we have one, we get a vote on that still. Commissioner Mayor. I, I will just briefly say that any question that I was, if I was able to kind of more so tailor it or be specific with the question I was gonna ask was going to be solely probably about the strategic planning process um, and maybe even in more particular, kind of them focusing on how they would actually get that process going and implemented, but yeah. Anyone else discussion? Commissioner Hanley? No. Okay. Do we have a motion? Commissioner Hanley? I motion that we offer a second interview to candidates Karen Kovacs and John Kramer to be at a to time to be determined at a later date over Zoom. Over Zoom is the last part you said? Yeah. Okay. Do we have a second on that motion? Commissioner Bonzo? I'll second that motion. Okay. Any discussion on that? All in favor, please say yes. 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 All opposed, please say no. Motion passes 7-0. Well, I just wanted to say thank you to all of the candidates who applied, to all of the candidates who interviewed, all six, did a, a really incredible job. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the second round to, to firm up which of these two candidates we'd like to name as our next city manager. Okay, so thank you, commissioners. We are now moving on to our second public comment session for this special meeting. Do we have anyone? No one for public comment. Public comment is now closed. I'm debating. Do we want to do comments from the commission? <laughs> we, have a, we have a work session we're rolling right into after this. So unless someone has a burning desire to speak, I think we are, we've had enough time to discuss. 
Okay. Comments from the city manager? Anything? I'll, uh, I'll have my staff work with uh, Frank to schedule that special meeting, too. So we'll figure it out between now and the end of the week. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. All right. So this special meeting is adjourned at 5.40 p.m. We will reconvene at 6 o'clock for a work session on Yay. Lakeshore Boulevard Phase 2. So for anyone watching, I think it's...
Thank you, Kyle. Okay, we're back. Uh, we now have a work session, so let me go ahead and call that to order. The Tuesday, May 4th, 2021 work session of the Market City Commission to discuss Lakeshore Boulevard is now called to order at 6.01 p.m. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And as this is a work session, we will not be taking any votes. We'll have just some discussion on our one topic of Lakeshore Boulevard. We've got all commissioners present. I have no announcements. Do we have anyone for public comment? I believe we have no one waiting for public comment. Okay. Public comment is now closed. On to our one topic here. Again, this is a discussion on Lakeshore Boulevard. Uh, we have completed phase one of the project and we are now discussing phase two, which if memory serves is the coastal uh, restoration, kind of the dune grass, the plants, the natural habitat, um, and some of the other pieces along with that that we'll be discussing the plan, the funding, and um, how we move forward. I know we've got Dennis Stackowitz on the line. I'm Making sure we can get him up on the screen and I'll have him take it from here. Or did, did Mike, did you want to jump in? I see you. Dennis was having a problem with his computer. Oh. But he may be on the phone. I'm, 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 on, the, I'm on the phone. I'm, I call I'm the right the person? Screen. I'm having some yeah. technology <laughs> sure. with my laptop, but we can, uh, we can adapt and overcome. There you are, Dennis. We're able to see you just, oh, you keep flipping. I think someone else is also maybe not on mute. So, but you go ahead, Dennis. We can see you on the side. Okay, very good. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and Honorable City Commission. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to receive a presentation from us tonight. So as promised, we are back before you with what we consider our uh, final preliminary draft for phase two of the Lakeshore Boulevard. And you are correct, and that is the Lakeshore amenities, which would be the um, the, the rock and, and infrastructure that's going to protect the shoreline also combined with many natural features that we are, are, are addressing. And tonight I have our project team with us. We have Matt Clark, who's principal with Baird Associates. He's the project lead on their end. Nick Kilpola from Community Development Department. Uh, Mick is our team leader internally on this one. We also have representatives from the um, Superior Watershed Partnership, Carl and Jerry are available, and I also believe Jim Compton is with us here as well as part of the city team. It's our intent this evening to give you a follow-up. I know the city manager had forwarded the very thick preliminary design manual that Matt's team at Baird had put together, and we proofed and ran by our city department heads, and everything is copacetic on our end. I believe City Manager Angeli have forwarded to that to you about a week ago. Um, we're going to break that down for you this evening. Matt's going to give you a very short PowerPoint presentation to hit the highlights on that and some of the things we're doing. And then we're going to wrap it up as promised. I will, you'll turn it back to me and I will speak a little bit to the, the funding mechanisms that we're using for this. So Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Matt and have him lead you through the presentation and, and explanation of the final preliminary design. Thank you. Um, as Dennis mentioned, my name is Matthew Clark. I'm with Baird and Associates, and I'm leading the, the Baird team for the design uh, and implementation of the project. And what I'll do today is really give an update to the meeting we gave in um, January. Uh, and just let you know about the status and, and where we go in terms of schedule. So what I'm going to do now is share my screen. Thank you, Matt. Oh, host disabled participant share, screen sharing. Okay, we'll get on that. And we can hear you and see you. We're having okay. just a little bit of difficulty getting it set up, but we've got it now. I do hear a little bit of audio feedback, but maybe we're 
working through that too. We've got our awesome city staff here running around trying to figure it out. Um, if there are any okay. intros or, okay, it looks like you should be good to go. Okay, thank you. Yep. We are able to see your screen now. Thank you, Matt. Very good. Start at the beginning. Okay, awesome. So as the intro, I'll go to the first slide. And a lot of these you, you may remember from our January 19th meeting. Um, some have been updated, a couple have been added. So just getting back to the basic here, the, the project need is really about, you have an area, you know, 18 to 20 acres, severely degraded. You have a shoreline that's really, uh, you know, it's not safe, it's not usable. And it really doesn't provide a ton of, of good shoreline protection from erosion and flooding. So the purpose of this project, we want to improve coastal resiliency, create a living shoreline. We want to protect public infrastructure and create a public green space with waterfront access. So that's project need, project purpose. And what we have here is, let me see here if I can yeah, minimize that. Um, this will look familiar to you. It's, it's quite similar to the layout we gave in uh, January. Just starting from the south end here, what you see here is almost a thousand feet of dune repair. There are several um, areas in, that have essentially been trampled over uh, by visitors to the beach that we're going to fill, revegetate, and reestablish. We are going to provide a dedicated route across the dune, but it's going to be marked. There's going to be a map there so people don't wander off. And it's going to be right at uh, as Pine Street connects with uh, Lakeshore Boulevard. Further to the north, we have the control structure for the living revetment. And the living revetment will essentially extend from station 10 to 41 plus 66, essentially 3,200 feet. And its job is to provide aquatic habitat, but its main job is also to provide protection for shoreline erosion and coastal flooding. Now up here we have what's called a pocket beach because you want different habitats throughout the entire site attracting different critters. Uh, the Paca Beach is a very well-protected beach, so you're going to have different types of um, aquatic habitats on the beach than would be migrating and moving around the, uh, the living revetment here, which is a bit more exposed. There are control structures on the beach. This, uh, uh, in the space of it, nominally every 500 feet. In case there's any movement of the, uh, the material, which is four to eight inch, uh, this control structure will rise about a foot above the surface and make sure it's made of slightly heavier material. It'll make sure that any movement really gets stopped. And it's really a, a conservative measure. I don't think there's going to be much any movement at all, but we put these in there just to be sure. Further to the north, you'll see breaches in um, the living revetment, and that allows water in to create uh, wetlands in this area. Remember, this, this area, you know, 150 years ago was really a lot of wetlands and a lot of what we call dune swale. And we're trying to recreate that. Just like the living revetment, um, you know, there are thousands of miles of coastline, of course, in Lake Superior. There are almost a thousand miles of shoreline that is composed of stone. So this is really borrowing from nature and using it for not only restoration, but for infrastructure protection. On the upland side, where you see all the nice colors, uh, the green, the yellow, and the dark green are really the dune swale system that we want to create. The blue uh, represents water, wetlands starting all the way near the south end and continuing intermittently all the way through the north end of the project. For walking trails, we have a series of them uh, extending all the way along this arc, extending in light gray down to the um, pocket beach, and then coming back to the um, bike path that was built during phase one. Continuation 
all the way up to the boardwalk here that's going to go through the wetlands so people can access that. So it's really a good way to, to visit the parkland, to interact with the scenery, and uh, provides a really big improvement for the community. And the differences from the uh, January 19th version are really the, the wetland here and the further extension of, of dune repair. More or less, the rest of it is, is the same. The south control structure now is a different shape to be less obtrusive. And I think that's, uh, that'll fit better with regulators. Next slide. So the project benefits are we want to, we have improved flood and erosion protection. We have protection of public infrastructure, which is also very important. There's waterfront access for the public. And I want to focus on it's waterfront access for folks that are, are truly able bodied. You know, they'll be walking over four to eight inch um, cobble sized stones. So I, I don't expect everyone, but I think there are going to be a, enough people that they'll really get to enjoy right down to the water's edge. 18 to 20 acres of public part land, and of course, the major waterfront habitat restoration. The living revetments in cross section. So you'll be you'll be coming off of the dune swale arrangement, and this is how they they look like. The swale is down here at the bottom. The dune is at the top. It's it's vegetated. It'll it's integral with the living revetment. It's not as if they exist side by side. There'll be a trail that wanders in and out of the dune swale system, sometimes right next to the living revetment, sometimes a little further into the dune swale system. People will, the stone for the dune swale will simply go over the existing structure, come down on a six to one slope, so it's fairly gentle. Cobble beast material. So I, I want to make sure everyone understands this. What you see on the right side are two projects that we built up in Toronto. These are working cobble beaches. Okay, and I'll be showing a video at the end of my presentation to demonstrate the efficiency of cobble beaches. These cobbles right here, uh, they're a little bit smaller than uh, what we're going to propose. But nonetheless, uh, they function fine. They dissipate the wave energy and they do protect uh, the upland area. Notice that they're rounded. Okay, and these are rounded. These are from a local quarry. They're six to 10 inch, so they're slightly larger than our living revetment stone. But it's highly angular, okay? And that's really uh, because of, we wanna save money, we're going to use a quarried stone of four to eight inches. So it'll be angular, not as beautiful as these natural stones here, but the rounding that you see here and then the upper left and the lower left, that will occur with time, okay? I'm gonna say it's gonna happen next year after it's built, but certainly within five to 10 years, you're gonna see a lot of rounding of the stone. On the upland side, you see the dune swell system where it peaks gently and goes down and then comes back up. You'll have vegetation, trees, Equally important is to have good sight lines. You always want to be able to see the lake, whether you're driving by, whether you're on the bike path, down here in the uh, middle section, you'll see people right on the, uh, on the trail that's, that's near the living revetment. This is the uh, type of environment we want to create. Very natural dunes with vegetation that's fairly stable. It's also highly flexible in terms of resiliency. That's one thing that um, speaks very well to the project. So here you have post-construction, excuse me, pre-construction, uh, where you have a very degraded upland, not terribly usable, a shoreline that um, is, provides some protection, but nowhere near as much as needed, as you can see here by the condition of the road. And then the post-construction, where people driving by, riding on the bike path, can see out to the lake. Uh, the shoreline itself is well protected with the cobble revetment. There's a walking path for people to engage the, uh, the site, uh, walking on foot, and the bike path you can see right here. So for people who are just pedaling through. Um, so a lot of a lot of good things. You can see the smokestacks are, are down, which uh, I think that was pointed out by Carl. Make sure we had that in there. 
but you can see it's, it is a big improvement uh, over what I would turn to be you know, a, a bit of a public eyesore. So what I'm going to um, go into now is project implementation. Um, so just go over the schedule, really. Concept design, that has been completed. The preliminary design has been completed. We're now looking at the regulatory permit application. It's in progress. I would say we're probably 75 or 80% there. We just got out of a meeting this, uh, this morning, very productive. Bidding documents, we'd like to start doing that in the final design in May in time so that we can bid in July. Construction starting later on this year or early 2022. The asterisk there is, is you know, you got to have the permits, of course, and that's what um, we're working on right now. We did go through a pre-application process, pre-application meeting, uh, with the regulators, and they've really warmed to this idea. So, it uh, you know I'm thinking that this is this is a good idea. It, it probably has a lot of traction with the regulatory folks, and we've even spoken to people at the Corps of Engineers who, on the technical side, who also thought it was it was pretty innovative. I'm now going to show you a um, a shore protection video, and, and what I But I want you to pay attention to, so this is a cobble beach right here, okay? Small stones, but flat or slope. This is a traditional large armor stone revetment, okay? Large stones, steeper slope. And what you can't see here because of, you're done. And then way in the background is a vertical wall, okay? And I want you to observe all three of these in terms of the efficiency by which wave energy is dissipated. So I'm going to leap out of this presentation and go directly over here and start playing this. You can see here there's very little run-up on the Cabo Beach versus the um, large armorstone revetment. A lot of reflection here and even more reflection for the vertical wall. And I would almost guarantee you that the cost on a per foot basis for large armor stone revetment versus small cobble sized material is quite a bit different. The cobble sized material is much less costly than an armor stone revetment. So I think that really brings it home to me as to the efficiency of Mother Nature, really. So I'm gonna jump out of here. Get back to the presentation. So I, I'm just opening up for questions, or do you wanna go continue on, Dennis, into your- I'll side. go ahead and I'll go ahead and continue on okay. and, and do my part now. Okay, I'll, I'm gonna hand it off to, to Dennis Stack, who wants to talk about funding. I'll go to the next slide. Thank you, thank you, Matt. So for the funding, we're looking at anywhere of a total project cost from eight to 10.3 million. And that in itself may look like a wide range, but it really depends on how the, the permits are going to, to play out with these permitting agencies. They could require certain things for us to do that could up the cost somewhat on that. And of course, you know, if the city commission were to choose a, you know, if we hear in the discussion tonight that we don't want the jagged rocks, we want the pretty ones. And of course that cost goes up as well. But as of right now, we're looking at, you know, $8 million on this. Now it's funded by a combination of grant and city funds. And we have applied for five grants and three of those have been awarded. Those awarded grants provide in excess of $1.5 million of grant funding. We have two scenarios that we're looking at right now. If we receive all of the grants, then our total obligation would be $4.8 to $7.1 million. Okay, that includes our any uh, cost above the grant and then our matching amount in it. And then scenario two is if we only can proceed with, you know, we don't get awarded the final two grants, then we have an obligation of 6.4 to 8.5 million. 
Um, the two grants that are left outstanding, the big one would be the FEMA grant that we've applied for, which is a FEMA brick grant. Um, that one would be good to get because that one would help us significantly. But in terms of, you know, funding, as you can see, the grants have, have helped out on this. And, you know, if we get that FEMA grant, we could be looking at, you know, being over three to four million dollars worth of grants uh, money provided for this. So those are those are the scenarios we have. Um, with that, uh, I'm I'm done. I'd like to turn it over to the city commission. Back to back to you, Madam Mayor, um, and our project team is here available for questions. Well, thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate the update and the presentation. The one question um, I have before we get into um, questions and, and thoughts from the commission. This presentation, am I am I missing something, or do we not have this ahead of time? I don't think I said. Okay, I I was looking for it, and I was starting to think that I lost my mind. So thank you. <laughs> Could you please bring up the financial slide? I think that's one that because we don't have it in front of us, that we're not going to be able to refer back to. I think the rest of it we had seen before at a prior work session, if I'm not mistaken. I didn't hear any glaring differences. I think the finances is really the big piece. There's, um, yep. and this I is, remember uh, getting that Excel sheet, but this is a different summary version, correct? Yeah, this is a summary version. This is uh, identical to what I had sent to the city manager. I believe he did forward this to you last week with an Excel spreadsheet. Yep. And then a breakdown that uh, I had had put in the email form. And I have that. Let me pull it back up. I was getting confused. I was trying to follow along with where you guys are at. Sorry, I'm, I'm digressing from the, the point here. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Thank you. Okay, so I think that you've done a nice job presenting where we're at. I'm thinking the money is probably the big question in a lot of folks' minds. I will run through the commission. We started with Stonehouse, our last meeting. That was just a little bit ago. So we'll start with Commissioner Bonzel and run down the line here. Sure. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just had one question after reviewing all of this, and forgive me if this is an ignorant question, but um, weren't we looking into the possibility of trying to get some funding from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at one point? And if that's the case, if I'm remembering that correctly, could somebody comment on that from staff? The manager is going to comment on that. Yes. Uh Yes, yeah, so we still have one grant that's out there, and, and Dennis, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Is that one of the five that you're presenting, or is that uh, a six grant? Uh, no, the the FEMA grant is one of the five. No, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, USAC, the the ten million dollars. Oh, grant. the USAC, yeah, the USAC is not included as one of the five, I believe. But we have applied for that grant. Uh, we're just. Uh, not including it in this discussion because it's several yeah. years out or several or it could be years in the and that's not a grant that's a that's not a, a grant per se it's it's really emergency funding through the army corps of uh, engineers and that's the section 111 program could i mean could you all maybe provide just a brief overview of like the details the logistics of how that that all might work because that might be helpful given that that wasn't included in the spreadsheet that we received. Um, I'd be glad to do that. I don't know that I could do it this evening. That's one that um, I don't really think we're going to get, to be honest with you. I think Jerry's on the line that can maybe give you a better uh, a feel of what the ballpark would be on that. But I, I have, my personal history with those USAC grants have been no goes. We've tried section 14 three times and been denied. And I've, I'm not quite sure we're gonna get the 111. Jerry, can you, or Carl, can you help a little bit with that on what the dollar amounts were on those? Sure, I can answer, Dennis. Um, Thank you. The section 111 um, essentially pays for damages caused by a federal structure. And there were previous studies, as you know, that showed that the extension of the break wall at Presque Isle is what caused all the erosion of that shoreline. 
<clears throat> so right now it's, you know, in the preliminary project phase, they're trying to obtain funding to do a study on the project, which, which is quite far behind where we are now. And they're, they're very, very slow in response, but we have requested an update and we just haven't heard anything recently, but we can certainly provide one as soon as we have it. Okay. And it would be a cost shared study and then feasibility and design as well. And unless, you know, we're able to negotiate something to skip through all that with them. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. And Probably it, would take at this point, do we know how much it would, we would potentially be eligible to receive, or is that still a very broad range at this point? I think that would be determined during one of the study phases, but I, the authority does allow up to $10 million to be allocated. With, with a cost share. And the cost share would be established based on the cost share of the original Presque Isle break wall extension project, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 30%. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Davis? Yes, I'm looking, um, looking at the timeline that you posted in the bidding in July. What is the timeline for finding out about the FEMA grant and the other grant that you talked about? We should have an answer on the FEMA grant here coming up by the end of the month. We actually have had some correspondence. Uh, Jerry had reached out to them to check on the status of any awards or any announcements. And I believe we had heard that would be um, we'd have an idea by the end of May. Now, the award itself, I believe, wouldn't come out till later in the in the year. Is that correct, Jerry? Yes, and you know, and they've also they're they're up to date on where we are with the project as well. Um, and you know, they they've instructed us to keep them in touch with them, you know, so they can update things. But once they determine that they would want to make an award, it it'll go through the um, environmental review process and that's kind of what takes the time but we should know like Dennis said probably by this late spring early summer okay that'd be great what about the other grant which has so far been unnamed <laughs> Dennis I, mean, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't hear what the oh, setup is. Oh, what about the second grant that you actually didn't provide a name for the second grant? You said you're waiting on two grants. Yeah, Jerry, can you update us on that one as well? Um, I believe that one's still pending, but we'll have to check on that. We should be hearing something right. pretty soon. But it sounds like both of them we should be able to hear before we go into budgets uh, in August. Correct, and that that one yeah. wasn't a significant amount of money. It was in, it was focused on you know getting another agency involved with some of the habitat restoration goals. Okay, there's a lot of interest from you know a lot of the agencies that we work with, and there's a lot of them watching this project, you know, both regionally and nationally. And that one, I believe, doesn't have a match. I think. Okay. Um, Matter of fact, three the three grants that we have received, only one of them has a match. SWP has been very helpful with the partners that two of the grants we received don't uh, um, don't have a dollar match from the city, uh -huh. but they have a uh, time match from from SWP. So they they've been very helpful on that end. Okay, um, I just want to say thank you, Commissioner Bonzel, for asking the question that you asked. That was a really good question and. Thank you, Superior Watershed, uh, because I think that we're successful with grants mostly because you're of, of your involvement. So I really appreciate that. Commissioner Hanley? Sure. Member Tim Hill? All right. Um, so who is the second grant with, or to, or from? <laughs> Pick your preposition. Dennis, were you able to hear that? I cannot, I couldn't, everything was coming across garbled. The, the second grant we're waiting to hear from, what's the deadline and what is the entity that would be paying the funds? 
Um, Jerry, can you answer that, please? Jerry, yes. I'm, I'm picking on Jerry a lot, but Jerry handles, SWP handles all the grants for us because we don't have a dedicated grant person right now. Yes. Uh, hi, Commissioner Hill. It <laughs> is through the Great Lakes Fish and Wildlife Restoration Act run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And that is another one we should hear any time if we have been invited for a full proposal. It was a pre-proposal that was submitted. And okay. And the other one that was awarded was from the U.S. Forest Service. That'll help pay for some of the tree planting and the upland um, enhancements. Is that's the GLRI forestry? Yes. Okay. I'm just trying to match up what we were sent earlier this week with what's being presented today. Um, right. And I don't have it in front of me. I apologize. But I think I know which ones. I think those are the ones that you're looking at. Yeah. So the, um, so the, the, the question of moving forward before we have all the money, I think that's really what we're trying to get at here. And can you give us a percentage estimate of how much money we'll have when we get started and how much money, because I see differences of three, two to three million dollars in each scenario. So helping us understand that difference of the difference between 4.8 and 7.1 and then the difference between 6.4 and 8.5. Um, I, I, this, what, what's going on there that we would have this difference what's going on there is I, I you know what we're hearing from the commission this evening is i haven't heard anyone protest the type of cobble we're going to use so we're going to be able to keep our cost down on that closer to the eight million mark which is where we want to be at for total project costs and then the rest of it we're at the whim of state federal government when it comes time to permit now Matt's been working very hard with them. They were very receptive during the pre-application conference and that we've been working through with them. So unless we see a sky high jump in materials cost or we get stuck by a higher level of government on this, we should be able to keep it down towards the lower end. But for the sake of managing expectations, I, you know, we have to put that range out there. So what would the permits have us do that we would have to pay more money for? Can you I would look to one of the engineers to maybe answer that one, Matt or Mick. Yeah, the, so the, the permitting agencies, at least the core, they look at um, overall environmental impact. Also, um, they look at impacts to adjacent properties and impacts to navigation. In our design report, we address impacts navigation and impacts to adjacent neighbors, we actually go through a process and, and just flat out say there aren't any, okay? But the final decision maker on that are the regulators, okay? And they may want additional safeguards to make sure there aren't any impacts to navigation, there aren't any impacts to adjacent properties. We don't know what those are. And that's what could actually drive the cost, the cost up. Or as Dennis said, you know, if there is a, a spike in demand for stone, then that will definitely affect the project cost. All right, that helps. Uh, I and then the other thing I noticed is we're going to have to do replenishment of the stone. And um, what can, uh, so we're entering into something like everything that requires maintenance and are there, I don't see any estimates here of maintenance um, and uh, how, and how, how is that, have we, have, do we have a plan for that? The, the maintenance is really dependent upon the results of the monitoring, so that there's no guarantee that the, that the stone is going to be displaced to the extent where it has to be regraded or anything like that. I think the first thing that we need to do is to set up a monitoring program. Those are relatively 
inexpensive, you know, less than 50, maybe even less than $20,000. And the, if we had maintenance, it wouldn't be every year. It would be probably every three to five years. And, and as I mentioned, the maintenance is to, isn't to to bring in thousands more tons of stones. It's to do things like maybe regrade the slope, something like that, something that can be very done by really a lot of contractors. So it's, it's fairly simple and it's fairly inexpensive. And we've discussed this with our public works department about the ability to do any of that grading as house in-house as well. So it's very, very minimal activity. So if I did hear the monitoring is going to cost 20 to 50. Is that just set up or is that an ongoing annual cost? No, you would do that. So let's say you would do that. You have information now in two years, you would do that probably a drone survey and maybe a BASI survey. You then look at the results, compare them against the, uh, the current information, and then do another one two years from that. And that gets you three data sets. By that time, you should be able to get a feel for the, really the amount of movement that's occurring with the living revetment and be able to plan out any maintenance with a lot better uh, understanding of what's actually needed. But sitting here, before construction, I think the maintenance is going to be fairly simple and it's going to be fairly minimal. And I guess, and I understand that, I just, it would help to actually have some kind of number attached to it as we keep, um, we're taking this on and that's, and this is a valuable project and it, um, but to understand the full cost of it to the city is going to be really important. And um, we're going to need to build that into budgets. And um, so it would be helpful to have a sense of what that would be. Um, especially since, again, we don't have, we don't seem to have all the money in hand um, as we go into bids. And I guess this gets into the, to the question of, we were initially asked to bond for 11 million. Now we, we, we're gonna bond for 6.2. It seemed like most of it came out of this project. So is, is there, I guess, since we were only bonding for 6.2, is, and the numbers didn't seem to change that we were presented from January, what, what, what's happened? I, I also am trying to connect all these dots. I don't understand. I believe that Gary would tell you that the, the money that was bonded for, for the, that's related to this project was just enough to get us started if need be. Yeah, Gary would plan on, or finance would plan on spreading the bonding for these grants over a period of budgets, a period of years. And Correct. The, uh, yeah. the reduction that you saw in the bond uh, presentation earlier this week from 11 down to 6.2, basically uh, reduced the roughly $5 million in matches that was required for this project down to 1 million for this budget year. You would probably look at uh, additional uh, uh, dollars to future budgets to cover those uh, those uh, those matches as well. It's a, it's a complicated process, and I apologize, Gary's not here to explain it, but um, it's, uh, blending or uh, uh, spreading the, the cost of the uh, matches out over a series of budgets. It's how we've been approaching it. I guess, yeah, it would be also be helpful to see that. I guess it, it, getting these things piecemeal like this, it's very hard to know what I'm actually voting for. And um, I, uh, and so it is, would, um, well, we're not voting on anything, I guess. It's a work session. But when we do come to the time to vote, um, you know, when, what money do we have in hand? What money would come in and then by what date? What date do we expect to spend the money? What's going to be the maintenance costs and plan? Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of commenting on the project, uh, I think the video does an excellent job of explaining, you know, why we're doing what we're doing. 
Um, I guess my last thing is it is also mentioned the triangle property is mentioned in the report um, in a, and I don't see it mentioned today. Um, and that's NMU property, but it was included and I wondered what uh, what's going is is I was confused by that. That property, the triangle property, we've been working with Northern Michigan University outside of this project. Um, and, and we secured, and actually the commission approved a coastal zone management grant to work on that triangle property. We're doing some drainage improvements and an interpretive trail actually through the woods in conjunction with NMU. And that's been removed from this project area because we don't want the federal government getting involved with it because it would be, you know, they, they look at things by boundaries of project areas and we did not need FEMA asking us why we added that to the project later on. So we're treating it as somewhat separate, even though it's mentioned in the report, it's really anecdotal in the report. Okay. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that matter, Mick. Um, I do, Dennis. Commissioner, yeah, this is Jerry again. Um, also, that wetland was used as a reference wetland for, you know, some of the habitat restoration design, you know, because it is, you know, a historic pristine, not really pristine, but it, you know, it's a great example of natural coastal wetland habitat adjacent to the project. If I could just comment a little bit more on the grants. Um, you know, this, this project is, is something that, uh, you know, I mean, the commission has been approving as we've been going along and the, and the, the financing has, I mean, it hasn't really been a mystery. I mean, maybe some of these numbers haven't been as clear as maybe they, they should have been in the past, or maybe some of these numbers have been, uh, uh, forgotten. But, uh, if you look at the scenarios up there, I mean, we give you the worst case or the best case scenarios, if we receive all the grants, which is our goal. Uh, that the uh, total city obligation would be 4.8 million as a match uh, uh, if we get the $8 million uh, price tag, if we get the lowest price tag, which is what we're after. And I'd be happy to make a comment about the cobblestones too at some point, because I think there's a pertinent uh, question there as well. But, um, and if you look at the other scenario too, if we only get the current grants, our obligation is gonna be 6.4 million. Now, uh, some of that money has already been budgeted in this year's budget. Uh, I don't recall the exact amount, but part of our capital improvement this year has been to cover some of that uh, 4.8. Am I correct about that, Dennis, or is that 4.8 in addition to what we have? Yep, this no, year? no you, you're correct. Okay. You're correct in that. All right, and then- uh, you know, if I, Go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, if we go back, I mean, we originally pro projected $13.2 million, I believe was the number we had originally told the commission over a year ago. And, and that included phase one of the project. Now, you know, with doing phase, we actually did phase one of the project with the grant, and then we added the bike path, which was supposed to be part of phase two, but we got a pretty significant savings on that. You know, even if we come through at the 7.1 million, we're still probably going to be, I don't know, maybe Mick, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we might be two million. This meeting is being recorded. We originally told the commission. <laughs> we missed the last the cost. last part of what you said, Dennis. Sorry, Zoom Zoom oh, interrupted uh, us. <laughs> yeah. So you know, even if even if we were to be on the high end. Um, you know, say in worst case scenario of 8.5 million, well, with, with what we've invested in, in the first phase of it, we're still going to be $2 million under the 13.2 that we already told the commission the cost would be. So, I mean, there's been significant savings across all of this. And I can't really speak for Gary's part about the shell game about you know, I, <laughs> we'll I, all I know is he really <laughs> likes to spread that bonding out because it helps save our bond rating by not over bonding for projects. And if he can spread it out over two years of bonding, then we keep the higher rating, which gets us better interest rates. 
I mean, this whole project, we've been chasing these grants and, and uh, you know, we've we've tried to work with best case versus worst case scenarios as far as getting the grants. And I don't think there's been any mystery amongst us and we hope we didn't project no, it's one. it's not that it's not a mystery. It's that we don't, I, I, you know, just put it in front of us. That's all. That's all I'm asking for. Well, some of those know. some of those things are pretty detailed, and it's it's not something that we have right now. I guess we could, but uh, you know what we're trying to explain is there. the general dollars that we have here and the and the general responsibility. I mean this this whole project is being driven by the fact that our shore was washing away, and that we needed to do something to to do it. And when we entered into the project several years ago, we knew it was going to be a struggle financially. We knew it was going to take a significant amount of money. Uh, uh, match-wise in the millions of dollars. Uh, our first original fear, like Dennis said, was that we were looking at 13 million, which could have been a match up for six or seven million dollars. And uh, we've been working steadily to try to bring that down. Now, what I can do is, is after this meeting is get together with Dennis and we can come up with some more detailed uh, dates and numbers for you, but we cannot uh, give you um, exacts or I can't give you promises that a lot of these are going to work out. We're trying to give you the best and worst case scenarios with the understanding that no matter what the scenario is, we have to accomplish this project. And by that, I mean, we may have to make adjustments, adjustments to future budgets, to future CIPs to, to get this project out of the way. Um, it became one of the priorities of the commission uh, several years ago, and we've been trying to, to get through it with the least possible uh, investment, the least possible impact to our capital improvement as far as negatively affecting other projects, uh, but knowing full well it was going to be expensive. And, uh, you know, we've, uh, uh, you know, we've managed to work with uh, Baird to bring the price down as much as, as we can. Uh, and like I said, the worst case scenario or the best case scenario is going to be 8 million. And we hope to get there, at which your time your match will be 4.8, but that's if we get all the grants. So we're, we're kind of working that we hope we get all the grants. Uh, but that's, I mean, oh, it's, a, it's kind of like a gamble or sounds like a gamble. But if we didn't need to do this project, we wouldn't be, I wouldn't be asking you to, to speculate or gamble at all. So that's, that's it. Thank okay, you, Mike. Well, I, I, I'm, I, I'll pass. Okay. Commissioner Mayor. Thank you. Um, all right, so Dennis, I have a question for you here. Um, we had our first slide there, and it was showing us this essentially like a blueprint of the whole project. We had a couple slides of different types of stone, and now we're talking about uh, the, the dollars here. And I guess from where I'm sitting, it looks like we're just talking about how expensive of stones we want to buy. And I'm curious if there's anything else around this project right now that we also could be discussing because um, just based off the kind of quick PowerPoint there that's that's what I feel like I'm looking at yeah the well I I would recommend you look at it from this point we this is some heavy-duty engineering that we really can't do in-house and we had selected Baird to do that for us because that's what they do and Pretty much what I've heard from Matt, and he can confirm it here this evening, is that, you know, the design has to be the way it is because they've looked at bathroom metrics, they've looked at climate projections, they've looked at all of that data, and the design needs to be what it is. And he's recommending we use uh, a certain size cobble. And really the only alternative that we have in that is you want the pretty rounded ones or do you want to save money, put the jagged ones in there and let nature do its work for five years. Okay, um, thank you, Dennis. It, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk about rocks. Um, <laughs> so essentially <laughs> what we're looking at here is we could go the cheaper route and get the rough, rougher stones, the quarried stone, or we can have nicer rocks and spend a couple million more, right? Correct. All right, thank you. Yeah. And just for the record, the, the uh, flat rocks work just as well as the round ones. <laughs> That's the point I wanted to make, is that we can get those a lot cheaper. Uh, in five years, they probably will be round, just from the wave action. Right. So. Right, exactly. 
All right. Thank you, Dennis. This is Jerry. I just wanted to mention one more thing about that. In addition to that, you know, as, as Matt mentioned during his presentation, a lot of the cost, the range of the costs is going to depend on the outcomes of permitting as well as bidding for construction. Right. Um, and, you know, those things are coming up very quickly. So we should know more, you know, once we get those applications in and once we get the bids out and, you know, be able to better refine the costs at that time. I would just to echo what Jerry said. It, it, we say eight to ten because of where we are in the project and the contingencies that apply. When when you do cost estimating like this, you really don't want to be pinned down to a number because there are still some remaining unknowns. So you you actually assign a range to it, and that's where the eight to ten comes from. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. I yield. Mr. Stonehouse. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, thank you all for doing the remarkably fine work you're doing. Uh, this is obviously a signature project for the city of Marquette. We're protecting our lakeshore. That's something that we critically have to do, especially in this era of, of climate change. And we're doing, I think, it the right way. We're doing it with a professional engineering firm that is highly regarded. We're not trying to do it like they did 30 years ago when they started to dump rock along the road and that was whatever garbage rock or broken up concrete they could find. We're doing it the right way and there is an expense to that. But I also have learned that we get what we pay for and this is going to cost the city money. We understand that. We've been budgeting for it for some time. The project itself has actually in one form or another been on the books for 10 years. So it's, it's certainly a while getting here. I don't have any specific projects or specific questions regarding the execution of the project. I, I understand. I've looked at the data on it. I'm very comfortable with where they are and where they're going and how they're going to get there. And I can only offer my, uh, again, my thanks for, for Dennis and the crew and the engineering firm for the wonderful work that they're doing for us. I will only close, Your Honor, by saying that in everybody I've spoken with in the city, all the folks that have come up to me and, and chatted, they love it. They love Lakeshore Boulevard. They're looking forward to being able to get the next section done that gets them down to the lakefront proper. So certainly when we look at the iconic use of this roadway, the, the importance of that lakeshore, it is certainly well worth the effort we're making to, to put the whole package together and the flexibility we have in doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Hanley asked me to come back to her at you don't, you don't need to? And then Commissioner Davis had mentioned she had one other question she forgot to ask. Yes. I'll but go to first, her before I wrap things but up. But first a comment. You know, I'm very much in favor of this project. And um, just as Commissioner Stonehouse talked about, this is really a lot of what Marquette's all about and preserving the lakeshore in a really attractive manner. So I'm, I like the project a lot. I spent some time with the document that was sent. And one of the questions I have is that I, I noticed all of the borings and the monitoring and some of the results of that where they talk about the burnt odor. And this whole project will be bringing more of our public to the lakeshore and into that part of the lake. So if you could just talk to me about the safety of, of people being in the water in that area, it would be very nice to hear. I can, uh, I can speak to that a little bit now. We have, uh, I've been the primary liaison between this project team and the Cliffs Dow project team, as I think that's what we're concerned with and uh, any uh, potential concern over contamination or people touching things they shouldn't touch or any, any uh, adverse human impacts. And as we've gone through that process, we've run this design by the project team of TriMedia and Rich Barron. And we, you know, there, there could be something unknown, but at this time, everybody feels comfortable with the design that's going through. And keep in mind that, you know, the, the issue that is at the Dow site is not per se a direct contact issue with people, right? It's groundwater exceedances that would have potentially affect aquatic um, mechanisms and so on and so forth. It's not a direct contact issue. OK, 
Okay. So we will be continuing to monitor at these borings that are listed on that little map. We will continue to monitor the cliff, our obligation under the cliff stow site, not necessarily with the ones that are on the map. Those the soil borings that were on the map are engineered soil borings that help you design the subsurface structure to make sure that you're engineering it properly to withstand the action from the lake. What we monitor with are ground water watering uh, groundwater monitoring wells that we've placed at strategic locations to intercept the water, the groundwater flowing from the Dow site as it meets the surface water of the lake. Those are two different things. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I just want the public to feel confident about the safety of being in that water as we welcome them down to the lake shore. So thank you. You're welcome. And I guess I would just um, kind of wrap up comments by thanking you, Dennis, and Matt. I do have a couple questions. So um, I think you've done a nice job laying out what things are proposed to look like, what a variety of cost scenarios are. I guess the one kind of burning question I have is I've been on the commission long enough to have approved phase one. And... Um, at that time, we were told we would have a chance to approve phase two, and I'm wondering how that will come to the commission, what that will look like, if it's gonna be piecemeal, if it's gonna be this whole package. That's my biggest question, because when this, the capital improvements piece came last week, I think we put the cart before the horse a little bit, and I just am trying to make sure that's not the case moving forward. I'll, I'll start. Well, it, Let me start the answer to that question, Dennis, and then you can follow up, please. Yeah. Um, we, uh, as you're probably well aware, we did not include this, uh, some of this money in our capital improvement plan this year because we were not sure of the grants and what grants we were gonna get and we're not gonna get. So we, um, the most recent conversation we had was based on the fact of the three grants or at least the two of the three grants that we um, d know we're going to get. Um, the project would, uh, come forward through a process, and this is where I'd like Gary to, uh, or I'm sorry, where I'd like Dennis to step in, where I think the next step would be the permitting phase, and then after that would be uh, uh, bidding and, and things of that nature. So Dennis, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's correct. Thank you very much, Mike. The next, the next time the city commission would see this was when we would get to the permitting phase because it requires action of the city commission to um, advance through the permit phase. And then after that, it would be the bidding phase. Now, uh, we'll have you know, somewhat of a better idea of narrowing those things down but by the time we get to the actual, when we get to those actual phases. Now the question becomes, you know, if you wanna wait until you get the actual permit approval, then you're looking at not doing anything on this project until 2022. That's been, um, you know, we've discussed that internally as a team. And, you know, that that does leave us hanging out there on a couple of things. While it would be good to um, preliminary get someone on board, we have been working with the city attorney to where we could actually bid the project, select a contractor and have a 90 day contingency for a rebid on there. Um, we could potentially lock in some better costs up front doing that. And of course, that same contingency would have to deal with the permitting agencies if anything changed. And if it changed drastically, well, then obviously we'd have to come back to the city commission and say, wow, this is going to, you know, cost a whole lot more money. What do you want to do? How do you want to address that? But so what we'd like to do is, as I said, you know, we get authorization to submit the permit. And then we also put together the bid package on that to see what kind of things we could get via contingency with someone. And that's pretty much what we discussed. I don't know, Mick, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, not really. Okay. I guess my ask, regardless of whether you're gonna ask for the commission's approval before we have the permitting done or not, is that it comes to us as a whole package as phase two, not as here we have to approve the match for this grant, or here we need more money for bonds. I, I wanna look at the whole thing as a whole. 
up to 10.3 million, whatever that needs to be contingent on permitting. You can throw any contingencies you want in there, but I would like to have the big kahuna discussion, get it approved and move forward. Just wanted to make that clear. Not voting tonight, but. I think that makes sense from my perspective. And I think, uh, I think Dennis can understand that as well. And I'll make sure that's in place. Okay, thank you. Any last minute burning questions or um, comments before we close here? Commissioner Bonzo had his hand raised. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to, to uh, echo some comments that were made by some of my other colleagues and just say that you know, I have sat in on a couple of uh, webinars hosted by various organizations over the last year or so about coastal resiliency um, and about coastal erosion. And I mean, and we, we've even done it here in the city as well, but you know, across the state and the region, there's so many communities that are just really playing catch up right now. And I think that we're very fortunate to be in the position where for several years now, the commission and our city staff and consultants have all been working together proactively on this. Um, you know, I think that this could be a really great example for many other communities where instead of just basically dumping a bunch of boulders on the lakeshore and seeing what happens, there's a plan um, which is environmentally sustainable, fiscally sustainable, it's protecting infrastructure. So, um, and I just wanted to say though that as much as I think this is an incredibly important project, I think it is critically, uh, it is cr a critical objective that we really minimize impact to the capital improvement plan. Because while I completely agree um, that everybody I've talked to about the phase one project that's been completed is really happy with it and really excited about phase two, I've also heard from a reasonable number of people that they also don't want the badly needed road work on their street or on their drive to work to be put on hold for, uh, you know, potentially years. Um, so I think we need to find that balance in the next couple of budgets. Pro Tem Hill. Um, the question I have is, is anything, so what we have right now, is anything going to happen uh, between now and September to, you know, plants, um, any other improvements, things going to be happening, or what we see right now is what we're going to see until we begin phase two. Um, this is Dennis. So I, is that question pertaining to actual on the ground construction? So the landscape, I guess what you're asking is the landscape out there going to remain the same between now and September? And if that's the uh, question, then the answer is yes. I could bring you some flowers from my house if you would like. <laughs> Commissioner Mayor. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, for the point that you made. Uh, to everyone on the call, I do really appreciate all the hard work and effort everyone's put into it. My reference earlier about the rocks was more or less the fact that this does feel like it's getting kind of piecemealed to us. And I do want to really look at this whole thing and have a discussion with all of it in front of us. Um, so I do appreciate you saying that because that is more or less what I was getting at. Um, and I also think that Commissioner Bonsell brings up a very good point about the other various projects that could be affected if we start going more into the higher end of this category. And I think that's also something we should not only talk about, but if we could even see what some of those things might be that are going to be affected, I think that could help all of us make some decisions there a lot easier. Thank you. And Commissioner Mayor, Mayor, you'll see a little bit of that, of that when we go through the budget process. We'll look even a couple years out beyond one year for what the streets would be if we, you know, if we allocated this amount or that amount. So you'll be able to visually see which streets we're talking about delaying or, or not. So yeah, good question, but we will go through that Thank in you. detail. Awesome. Commissioner Stonehouse? Well, I would only add, Your Honor, that certainly what we do, we need to do it to the uh, the greatest extent uh, and still be able to maintain those critical programs we have in the city otherwise too. And whether that means stretching the project or compressing the project or making some alterations within the project, those are things we need to look at very seriously. Uh, I'm, I'm struck, however, when we interviewed uh, uh, Mr. Simpson a couple days ago, it seemed like a couple days ago, it was, that he made a comment that I think is very appropriate for what's, what we're doing we're not following best practice. 
we are creating it. And when you look at where we are as a city of Marquette, as in comparison to many of the other communities downstate that are having significant erosion problems, we are far, far ahead of the game. And I certainly commend again our uh, Dennis and his department, the city as a whole, certainly the engineering firm we hired for this particular project because it really is critically important to the city. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, I think that we've had enough time to discuss. I certainly appreciate, Dennis, your work on this. Mick, Jim Compton, we've got Superior Watership Partnership, Carl and Jerry and Matt Clark. Um, thank you. This is definitely a group effort. Thank you. And I know it's um, a lot of work behind the scenes you've been putting in, so really appreciate it. I think that's it for us at this point. City Manager, did you have any comments at this point? All right, so we've got another public comment session, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and do we have anyone? We do not. Public comment is now closed. So, just trying to see what time it is. We are adjourned at 7.07 .07 p.m. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Very good. Thank you. I know.